As part of a world religions class that I took, we went on a field trip to a Hindu temple that's actually right here in Oklahoma City. What I was surprised to find was right outside the Hindu temple there was a playground, just like you would expect to see at a church that the kids could play on outside. The building itself was very plain looking. The priest there did explain to us that they had artisans in India that were still awaiting visas to be able to come over here to decorate it like you would usually think of a really ornately temple being decorated, but it looked kind of like a concrete block at the time that I was there. Um, it's been a few years, so maybe they've got people to come over and make it look more like a temple now. Upon entering, there were wooden cubby holes that you would put your shoes in. We actually had to take our shoes off before we were allowed to go any further. And after that, we went into a room, and it was a big room with a marble floor, and at the end, there were five idols set up. And these were idols that were special or specific to that temple, but Hindus have thousands of gods that they worship, and so each temple just has to select a few that they can actually have idols set out for. And each of the idols had um, food in front of them. And um, one of the idols that I remember seeing there was a monkey. And it wasn't just like, a, it was a monkey like you'd see on a cartoon that could like kind of walk and talk and it had white fur. And the priest told us that what was significant about that god is that that was a monkey they believed actually walked on earth thousands of years ago and started talking for some reason. People could understand this monkey and so when he died, since this was an amazing talking monkey, they made him a god. And so they have stories behind a lot of their gods like that and they have lots of gods. And the priest also explained to us that they have actually two idols for each of the gods that they have there in the temple. They have a stone idol, and that's the idol they actually have displayed there in the temple. But then they have a metal version that's a lot lighter than the stone version that they use for processions, special events, and things like that. They also had in front of each of the idols a ring of bells, and a worshiper would ring the bells to clear their mind so they can meditate then, because Hindu has, involves a lot of meditation. The priest also told us while laughing, so I'm still not sure if he was serious about this or not, that they ring the bells that get the God's attention before they start meditating on the God. But he laughed as he told us that, so I really don't know if he was joking or some Hindus actually believe that. The room with these gods in and the big marble floor had absolutely no chairs. So when they have events there, you either stand or you sit on the floor. And you complain about the hard pews at your church. Especially here, you know, you've got these nice soft seats, no chairs whatsoever. It's either the floor or you stand. Um, they do have classes every Sunday, he said, for their youth and the kids, where they tell them the stories of their different gods. But a lot of what they do is meditation. Um, they would come and meditate on each of the gods, and that's the center of their worship. The priest that gave us a tour of the temple was the only full-time staff member at the temple that we have here in Oklahoma City. Because as you can imagine, Hindu's not a big thing in Oklahoma like it might be in India. He says in India, a, temple, a typical temple has probably 40 full-time priests that work there all the time. And it's how many people they have coming in, how big it is. But just one that was working at the temple here in Oklahoma City. The priest um, knew that we were visiting from a Christian university, so he emphasized that Jesus was one of their gods, too. When you have thousands of gods, it's no problem just adding another one. Oh, yeah, sure, that's one of our gods, too. So he wanted us to know, you know, oh, I'm right there with you. Jesus is one of our gods, too, and <laughs> because they have no problem just adding another god. And ancient Near Eastern cultures, the cultures that we've been looking at because they're the cultures that surrounded Israel in the Old Testament, they were commonly sharing gods, you know, taking a god here, taking and adopting a god. You know, maybe the god of the city next to him looked good to them. It was helping them out. So, oh, we'll make that god our god too. And so for the ancient Near East peoples, their problem wasn't with the god of Israel. It was that Israel said that their god was the only god and that none of the other gods were really gods. That was the real problem that they had with Israel. And when Nebuchadnezzar built a 90-foot tall gold image. He didn't care if people worshiped that giant idol only. He probably would have thought it weird if they did because the Babylonians, just like all the other ancient Near Eastern, had lots of gods. They didn't just have one god. The statue was probably more political than religious as well. 
He wanted to unite the various peoples because Babylonians had been conquering a lot of people. So it wasn't just Babylonians anymore. They had conquered a lot of people and were, and he wanted to unite them. And he thought a good way to unite them is if we all have a God that we can worship as our own. So you have lots and ways that are different. You know, you need some central point. And so he was using it not just as a religious purpose, but as a political purpose. He thought he could get everyone, you know, behind one God, they would all be more willing to follow him and go into battle and help him conquer even more people. According to Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar made a golden image, but the text never says who this was an image of. When the Israelites made a golden image, as you remember, they made an image of a calf. I like thinking of a 90-foot calf. We know this couldn't have been a calf because not only was it 90 foot tall, but it was 9 foot wide. So the dimensions aren't there for a calf. You know? <laughs> it had been a lot wider. It's probably um, a human-like figure that he had built. And some of the gods that it possibly was was either Marduk, who was the main god of the Babylonians, even though they had several gods, just like the Philistines had Dagon, and there was their, was their main god. Marduk was the main god for the Babylonians. Another um, possibility is that it was Nabu. It wasn't their main god, but this may have been a god that was special to Nebuchadnezzar because he was named after this god. The um, Nabu, um, part of his name, Nebuchadnezzar, is where we would get that god's name. And I've got there in your um, handout what um, Nebuchadnezzar's name means. It means Nabu, preserve my firstborn. So there are two suggestions. It could have been a god other than these, but... Most likely it was probably Marduk, their chief god, or Nabu, who um, Nebuchadnezzar was named after. Now, Babylonia, like Philistia, with its loosely affiliated five cities we've been calling the Philistine Pentapolis, isn't what you and I think of as a nation today. It was more a group of cities that each had their own king that um, were loosely affiliated with each other. That we know this area as Babylonia today, is how important this one city, because there was one city in particular that was named Babylon, how important it became. The king of Babylon, who in this story was Nebuchadnezzar, they had other kings, became the most important king of the region. The other kings in these other cities answered to them. And it became one of the first great empires in the world. There had been great <coughs> civilizations before, like Egypt, and we saw the Israelites escape from Egypt, but Egypt had always stayed in its area. And Babylonia really conquered the known world. And they, um, at the height of their power, until Alexander the Great came and then conquered the known world again, you know, they were it. They were the empire. They um, conquered even Egypt at one point. And so Babylonia was um, powerful, and it's a testament to how powerful this one city was that we know the whole area as Babylonia now. And the city of Babylon is approximately where present-day Iraq is today. In addition to all the gods that the city shared, sometimes the cities had gods just for that city. So, you know, there was gods that were gods of Babylonia in general, but each city maybe had their own god of that city. And before Babylon took prominence, sometimes these other cities that were in the Babylonian area at different times were the ones that were the most prominent city. Uh, before Bab Babylon became to prominence, it was a city called Nippur. That, you know, the king of Nippur is the one that all the other kings answered to. And the god of Nippur was named Enlil. And so for a long time, Enlil was thought of as the king of the gods for the Babylonians. And it was after Babylon became more prominent that Marduk, who was actually the city god of Babylon, became more prominent as well. Actually, Marduk, who was just the city god, like I said, you know, he was just the god of the city of Babylon. He wasn't the god of Nippur and Ur and some of these other Babylonian cities at this time. He was thought of pretty insignificant outside of Babylon. He was just those people's gods. But as um, the king of Babylon began conquering more and more, and more of the kings began answering to him, people started looking up, oh, well, maybe we want to adopt Marduk as our god too, and thinking that he was more important and began revering him. And as a sign that he was rising in esteem, we have stories, and they've discovered a hymn where Enlil turns over his kingship of the gods to Marduk. And that's about the name god for the Babylonians and takes over that place for Enlil. And so um, you see early on in Babylonia, the gods don't just have a religious purpose, they also have a political purpose. Whatever god is the biggest named god is the city that kind of is the one in control of everything else. So they're playing a religious and a political purpose. Like the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant when we talked about Dagon, 
um, a people called the Elamites came into Babylon one time and they captured an idol of Marduk and they took it back. Well, Nebuchadnezzar the first, and this isn't the Nebuchadnezzar that's actually in this story. The Nebuchadnezzar in this story is Nebuchadnezzar the second. So this is an earlier guy who happened to have the same name. But he went into a lamb and he conquered them and stole um, Marduk back and brought it back and he was triumphant. Then when Assyria invaded Babylon, they did the same thing. They took the idol of Marduk back with them um, because if you conquered a people, evidently your gods were better than their god. You conquered their god. Assyria later on uh, waned in power. They wanted to make peace with Babylon and gave their god back. So Marduk really got around, it seems. The Babylonians also had their own story of how the world was created called Enuma Elish. And in their story, Mar Marduk defeats Tiamat, who's the personification of chaos. And then once he defeats her out of her, he creates the universe, and he puts the city of Babylon right at the center of the universe. So the Babylonians thought pretty high of themselves. They, in their story of how um, their god created the world, they thought that their god put them at the center of the universe. Uh, the other possibility, like I said, for the statue is Nebu, because um, that's who Nebuchadnezzar is named after. And Nebu was Marduk's son in their stories of their gods. And so in Daniel 3, this gold statue, whether it was Marduk or Nebu, comes into confrontation with the God of the Bible. And in the first verse of Daniel 3, we read, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And if we convert those measurements, the 60 cubits high and the 6 cubits wide, we're talking about a statue that is very, very massive. It was 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. And it probably wasn't so an unimaginable amount of gold would have been needed to create something that big. We're already talking about something that's 90 feet tall. And even if Nebuchadnezzar had that much gold, it would have been impractical to build a statue that big out of just gold. So it was likely that it was made out of wood and then overlaid with gold. And access to large amounts of gold would not have been a problem for Nebuchadnezzar at this time. He was king of Babylonia during a particularly prosperous time for that empire. Riches flowed into Babylon from many of its conquered territories. They had even conquered Egypt at this time. So most of the known world was under Nebuchadnezzar's control. All the kings of all of these great nations were paying taxes and tribute to Nebuchadnezzar. So he had great wealth, great riches at this time, and great power. So getting the gold to do this probably wasn't a problem at all for him. And actually, during his reign... He embarked on several large architectural, lavish architectural projects. You've got a picture there on your handout of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which is even considered one of the seven great wonders of the ancient world. And that was thought to have been built during Nebuchadnezzar's rule as well. And so we go on in verses 2 and 3. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, pretty much all those people we just read, um, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. So if we look at the invite list, he's inviting the top people. He's not just inviting you know, the people that work in the factory or make the gold. He's inviting the people that are in charge, the officials. So it's apparent that he's not building this statue just out of religious piety like we said. You know, they a lot of times had political purposes with their gods. He has a political reason for doing this, and he's inviting all the leaders and officials that come. He has a political agenda. A number of very different cultures had been conquered by Babylonia and integrated into the empire. Worshipping the same image he hoped would promote unity among all of them. And verses 4 through 6. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound, and the writer of this chapter must have really liked lists. Um, we had the list of all the officials, and now, you know, instead of just saying the music, he says the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music. You must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. 
And some people have said, you know, maybe this was an image of King Nebuchadnezzar himself. I didn't give that as a possibility because that's probably not what it was. The Babylonians that we know of never worshipped their king. Some people did, like the Egyptians, they worshipped their pharaoh. The Babylonians didn't, so it's unlikely that all of a sudden they would have in this case and then on again. Um, and then verse 6, whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. The penalty for not worshipping the image was being thrown into a fiery furnace. And um, this wasn't just something special for this. Actually, um, being threatened to be thrown into a fiery furnace was a common penalty in Babylon. So if you caught doing something, that may be the punishment. And actually, um, you've probably studied in history, the um, Code of Hammurabi, which is one of the first examples you know, of a recorded you know, set of laws that we have, and it was done by um, Babylon. A lot of the crimes, the punishment for it was being thrown into a fiery furnace. So that was one of their common penalties for um, doing something wrong or a crime in Babylon. And we also see another example of it in the Bible as well. Two false prophets, Ahab and Zedekiah, are burned in the fire by this same king, Nebuchadnezzar. And we see that in Jeremiah 29. And Jeremiah 29, 22 says, May the Lord treat you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon burned in the fire. And here Jeremiah is warning the people of Israel. They've already lost their homeland and been conquered by Babylon because they were unfaithful to God. And he's saying, you're still being unfaithful, but you still have these false prophets, just like these false prophets were burnt. You're going to pay the consequences if you don't return to God. And continuing on in verse 7, we've got that list of musical instruments again. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound, we've got all those instruments again, of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods, who worship the image of gold you had set up. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were important officials. It says here you know, that he had made them officials over the province of Babylon. So here these people were, they're from Israel, they aren't even Babylonians, but they prove themselves that he's given them high official positions. They're here with all the other long list of officials because they've been made officials in Babylon. And some of the other people decide to come tattle on them. Hey, look what they're doing. They're not bowing down and worshiping that gold image like everyone else, like you told us to do when the music starts playing. And they were officials in Babylon, but they were also Jews. And their religion as being Jews forbid them from worshiping any god other than the one true god. And uh, continuing on with the story, it says, Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you, have, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue, rescue you from my hand? So here Nebuchadnezzar challenges the one true God. He says, what God will be able to rescue you from that fiery furnace? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If the God we serve is able to deliver us, then he will deliver us from the blazing furnace and from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. These three young officials know that God is capable of saving them from the furnace, 
but they know that he won't necessarily do it. Um, but they trust him anyway. They trust God, and they know that it's wrong no matter what the sir false gods, and they would rather become martyrs. They were willing to die for their faith because I'm sure they fully expected to die. They didn't expect God to save them. They knew if we get thrown into the fire, that's it. We're dead. And so it's even more amazing. You know, we read the story, and we know the end. We know that they make it through, and we're saying, oh, sure, I would do that. But they didn't know the end of the story. They knew that very well by not doing what the king was saying, that they were going to die. They were going to be tossed into a fire. But they said, you know, our God is capable of saving us. They knew that, and they believed that, but they knew he didn't have to. They knew that it was very possible that they would die, but they were willing to do that. And in verse 19, the Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times harder than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. So he has them turn the furnace up as hot as it will go. And the furnace was probably built into a hill. Um, the way they would have built these furnaces, um, they would have had a hill, and they would have dug into the hill and put um, whatever they burned in there to make the furnace, and then they would have had two openings to the furnace. One would have been at the top, so they've dug out, you know, and so there's a dug down. But they also would have dug to the side, so they can, you know, put things in, like maybe the gold they're melting for the statue. And so as these men were taking them to put them in, they probably took them up to the hill so they could just drop them in. And Nebuchadnezzar was probably sitting at the side of the hill, looking in this entrance, and could see what was going on inside the furnace. And so that's where he was, watching them as they were dropped into the furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, I think I skipped some, let's go back, uh, verse 24. Then Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his, oh, I'm lost, let's, I think I'm still, uh, <laughs> skipping too many verses there. <coughs> oh no, that's uh, where we are. Okay, they fell into the blazing furnace, then verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, your majesty. He said, Look, I see four men walking around the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. This may have been an angel, or it may have been Jesus making an appearance on earth before he was um, incarnated and born as a baby in the New Testament. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So he's shouting through that opening there for them to come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their house is turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save, save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. While Nebuchadnezzar was impressed with this god and the power that he had shown by saving Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the furnace, he was still missing the point. He didn't turn from the gods of Babylon that he worshipped and serve only the one true god, he just added God to his long list of other gods. Wow, that God is powerful. I'm going to add him to my gods after he saw what that God could do. When you already worship several gods, what's one more? Plus, it would seem handy to have a God on your side that can save his followers from a fiery furnace. And so when we're looking, you know, 
what does this showdown reveal to us about God? We can learn about God. We don't want to miss the point like Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar thought that he could still serve his own gods and the God of Israel, the one true God. And sometimes we become a Christian and we think, you know, we can serve God, but we can still do the things that we enjoy. We can still um, go out and do the things that we enjoyed before being a Christian. But we can't serve God and the world. We've got to be totally committed to God. When God wants us, just like he wanted the Israelites to serve only one God, he didn't want them to serve many gods, he wants us to have one love, and God should be that love. We don't have lots of gods you know, that we are tempted by. Um, there are Hindu temples here, even in Oklahoma City, we, you know, we kind of put those out of our mind, but that's not what's tempting us. You know, It's other things in the world that may tempt us. And if we're giving any attention to those, and you know, more attention to those than we're giving to God, then we're setting those up as gods, you know, before God. He wants our full attention. We can't serve both him and the world. And also, Nebuchadnezzar, he was building all of these amazing things, the hanging gardens of Babylon, this gigantic statue, and it seems like he was probably feeling his mortality. He knew that he would not live forever. He knew that he was a human and that he would die. And he wanted to leave some kind of mark on the world, some kind of legacy. And he thought the best way to do this was to build big and beautiful things. You know, surely I'll be remembered because of these great structures that I built. And he was trying to build his way you know, to immortality. And the same, you know, you can't build your way to heaven. It doesn't matter what you do or how hard you work. It's only God that can um, provide salvation to us. And all he asks is for our total devotion, our total love. 